Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 History Lecture Series. My name is Adam Warren, and I am an Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Washington. I am thrilled that you are all here, even if we cannot be together in Kane Hall. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that this event meets on the contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot nations and other Coast Salish peoples who call the waters and coastline of the Salish Sea home. The theme of this year's lecture series is technology and its discontents. When a group of faculty and staff decided on this theme in January of 2020, I do not think they could have imagined how timely it would be. In the midst of an airborne respiratory pandemic that prevents us from gathering together, it is new technologies such as the video conferencing platform we are using this evening that have enabled us to stay connected. At a time when our resources for treating COVID-19 remain limited, moreover, it is the development of vaccines, several of them based on new mRNA technology, that help us to envision and hope for a world where we can be together again. And in the meantime, it is a much more rudimentary technology, the face mask, that enables us to protect each other as we await that brighter day. In many respects, the history of technology has been widely imagined as a history of progress. We live in a world shaped by technology, and we take it as a given that technology has made our world better and will continue to do so in the future. Yet, technological advances have also come at a cost. While the development of the internet and social media has enabled people to find community in isolation and gain ever greater access to information, it has also fueled the circulation of misinformation in ways that have recently imperiled our democratic institutions. Production of computers, tablets, and smartphones, the very devices we use to access that information or misinformation, requires the use of materials extracted at a great environmental and social cost. And the events of the past year, now um, the past year, um, and given the events of the past year, now has never been a better time to consider how military and policing technologies have been harnessed to serve the interests of white supremacy and empire through violence. How then should we about the history of technology and its discontents? Our first speaker in this series can begin to help us answer these questions. I am honored and delighted to introduce Professor Lynn Thomas and welcome her to the virtual stage. Professor Thomas is a historian of modern Africa whose research to date has focused on politics, gender, and race in Eastern and Southern Africa. She came to the uh, Department of History after earning her PhD at the University of Michigan in 1997. She is a stellar researcher, instructor, and colleague, one who has had an immense impact on the department, the university, and the profession. Now, there are many wonderful things I could say about Professor Thomas as a colleague, instructor, and former department chair, and that has made writing this introduction a challenge. The one thing that especially stands out to me this evening, however, is that any one of her previous research projects would have been fine candidates for this lecture series. Professor Thomas is the author of two single author monographs, in addition to two edited volumes and multiple journal articles. Her first monograph, Politics of the Womb, Women, Reproduction, and the State in Kenya, reconstructs controversies over female circumcision, childbirth, premarital pregnancy, and reproductive technologies like abortion in colonial and post-colonial Kenya to demonstrate, among other things, how girls and young women contested the scope of state power and renegotiated their relations with men and senior women. In her second monograph, Beneath the Surface, A Transnational History of Skin Lighteners, Professor Thomas reconstructs the global circulation of skin lightening products and ideas about skin lightening itself between the United States and Southern and Eastern Africa, focusing especially on South Africa. Drawing on a vast archive that includes visual sources, so things like cosmetics, advertisements, and magazine covers, as well as written materials and oral histories, Professor Thomas considers the body's surface as a site of anti-racist struggle and lighteners as a technology of visibility that both challenges and entrenches racial and gender hierarchies. The book is a remarkable tour de force worthy of the accolades it has received. 
And as an aside, I should note that it also has the enthusiastic endorsement and recommendation of the Department of History's undergraduate honors students who read it in a course with me last spring. Many identified it as their favorite book of the quarter and one student even credited Professor Thomas for convincing him through the example of her research to become a transnational historian. Professor Thomas's new research project focuses on environmental history. While her lecture this evening, From Caravans of Gold to, to Atomic Bombs, African Mining in World History, is not directly related to that work, it engages many of the same themes. I am delighted that we get to hear it and discuss it. While we are listening and during the discussion at the end, please feel free to enter questions you may have into the Q&A feature on Zoom. You may also upvote questions you have already posed that you would like answered. And with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Thomas to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Adam, for that um, generous and wonderful introduction. Professor Warren, thank you very much. All right. Um, so in the year 2021, what comes to mind when we think of mining in Africa? Perhaps it's this 2006 Hollywood film. Blood Diamond graphically depicted Sierra Leone's civil war of the late 1990s as a conflict fueled by the illicit trade in diamonds. Blood Diamond linked violence and greed in West Africa to wedding rings sold around the world. Or perhaps you think of coltan and cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the DRC. Coltan and cobalt are rare minerals that are essential to technologies that we use every day, from smartphones and computers to cars with lithium batteries. The DRC is estimated to contain 80% of the world's coltan and 60% of its cobalt. So numerous journalists and human rights groups have highlighted how the world's wealthiest technology companies, so companies like Tesla and Apple, Google, Intel, Microsoft, how those companies now depend on and profit from minerals mined in one of the poorest countries on earth. Coltan and cobalt mining in the DRC, like diamond mining um, in Sierra Leone, are linked to conflict, corruption, child labor, and environmental crisis. At the same time that African mining has gained a bad international reputation, it has become increasingly important on the continent itself. Today, so-called extractives, meaning oil, gas, and minerals, rank as Africa's most valuable exports. In the late 20th century, the liberalization of investment regulations as part of broader structural adjustment policies attracted mining companies from around the world to Africa, um, and especially mining companies from the US and from China. Um, in the early 21st century, then the, commodity, the global commodities boom deepened the presence of those companies. These same developments also encouraged the growth of artisanal or small scale mining in Africa. It's estimated today that 70 million Africans rely indirectly or directly on artisanal mining for their livelihood. And that's roughly five times the number who did so in 1999. While mining makes some rich, for many more people, it's a way to make ends meet. Um, and this photograph here um, was taken by my colleague, Professor Danny Hoffman um, in the Jackson School. Um, it's a photograph of an artisanal miner in Sierra Leone. Um, and Danny's done fantastic ethnographic work um, on miners in West Africa. So this evening, I'll place these current trends and images in historical perspective by making three big arguments. So the first is that for centuries and even millennia, the mining of minerals has been one of the most important technological processes linking Africa to the wider world. Second, through those linkages, African mining has generated significant wealth, it transforming entire regions of the continent, but it has also generated significant hardship or discontent. And thirdly, the history of mining in Africa is the history of what scholar Gabrielle Hecht has termed turning the world inside out. 
For thousands of years, but much more intensely over the past century, humans have deployed technologies to dig up the Earth's surface, and in turn, we've used what we've dug up to develop new technologies. Substances long trapped inside the Earth have been upended, finding their ways into our lives and our homes, as well as into our waterways and into huge piles of waste. Turning the world inside out, like climate change, which it helps fuel, is a defining feature of our age and of the much longer history of humans on Earth. So today, industry insiders view the African continent as the world's most underdeveloped region for mining. So Africa accounts for roughly one third of the globe's mineral reserves. Now, part of the reason why minerals are so plentiful in the continent um, relates to the continent's unique geology. So much of Africa is covered in very old and highly weathered rock. So on this map, you'll see that the pink and the brown areas represent the very oldest rock on Earth. And what you can see is that South Central Africa, West Africa, and then parts of Northeast Africa have a lot of that um, brown and um, pink shaded area. So as the earth formed, um, mil minerals and heavy metals were drawn into the planet's deeper layers. Um, but through aging and weathering, those deeper layers have been brought to the surface and made more accessible to humans. So what all this means is that for a very long time, people in Africa have been able to mine for minerals, even with just handheld tools. So mining has a very deep history on the continent. Now this evening, I won't be discussing all the minerals mined in African history. Um, the continent is truly vast. So it's bigger than the contiguous US, China, India, and most of Europe combined altogether. Okay, so because Africa is so vast and our time together this evening is brief, um, I will focus on one of the most alluring minerals, gold. And at the very end, I'll also say a little bit about uranium. Okay, so um, looking at this map here, so this is a map that shows the major gold mining sites in Africa in 2009. And what you can see is there are basically three areas of the continent where there's quite a bit of gold mining um, taking place. So the first is in the Northeast area, um, then in West Africa, and then in Southern Africa. Um, and my lecture tonight is gonna move through those three regions and also move through them um, in a chronological fashion. Okay, so when we think of gold in ancient Africa, it is likely this iconic artifact that comes to mind. So Pharaoh Tutankhamun's funerary mask is made of two layers of gold, um, and it's also decorated with lapis and other gemstones. Um, and you can see how the, um, the layer on the face um, is really shiny, um, and that's because there's actually a lot of silver mixed in with that gold, whereas the gold on the back um, has a yellowish color um, because it's, it's more pure gold. So this mask was manufactured sometime around 1323 BCE in a period of intensive gold mining in ancient Egypt. Um, so this next map here is a contemporary map of Egypt and Sudan, um, but it, the yellow dots indicate where the ancient gold mining sites were located. Now, the very earliest gold mining in this region dates back at least 2,000 years before Tut to 3500 BCE. Um, and it mainly took place between the Nile and the Red Sea in an area that had a lot of quartz um, rock formations that contain gold. Now, by the time of Tut's rule, um, gold mining had shifted farther south um, into what is today southern Egypt and northern Sudan. And that area in the ancient world was Nubia. So ancient Egyptians closely associated Nubia with gold. In fact, the ancient Egyptian word for gold, NB, is closely related to Nubia. So for Egyptians, Nubia was the place of gold. So this spectacular wall painting from the tomb of an Egyptian um, official stationed in Nubia depicts Nubians presenting Pharaoh Tutankhamun with bags of gold dust and circular ingots um, of solid gold. So Egyptian pharaohs invested heavily in fortifications and mining operations along the Nubian frontier. But then over time, Nubia 
developed its own powerful tradition of kingship and a court life that was in large part funded by the gold trade. So Nubian's goal was vital to Egypt's influence and trade in the wider region. Um, a trove of diplomatic correspondence compiled during the reign of Tut's father includes a letter from the king of Babylon um, in which he pleads with the pharaoh to send more gold for decorating his temples. He wrote, um, why have you sent me only two minas of gold? So only about um, two pounds. We, my work in the houses of the gods is abundant, send much gold. And you, whatever do you need from my land, write and I will, it will be sent to you. So ancient technologies of gold mining um, were very similar to those that would be used across the continent in subsequent centuries. So basically there are two types of mining. There's alluvial or surface mining, and then there's underground mining. So alluvial mining involves gathering gold dust and gold nuggets that have been freed from ore, usually quartz ore, through erosion. So as in the U.S. West, ancient Egyptians and Nubians um, panned for gold. So they scooped out mineral rich sands and soils um, they shook them in bowls of water so that um, the dirt and lighter, lighter minerals would float to the top and the heavier gold would sink to the bottom. Um, so underground mining also occurred though, and it occurred in open pits or trenches like the one on the left, um, and also through tunnels and shafts that could reach depths of up to 95 feet below ground. So in underground mines, ancient miners used pillars of stone and wood um, to secure ceilings and walls, but mines were always, um, always ran the risk of collapsing. Underground miners dug out ore and then they ground it using millstones like the one on the right. Um, and after grinding the ore, they would wash it and they possibly use sheepskin as a filter then to collect the particles of gold. The gold that was gathered then was transported to the Pharaoh. Um, the next slide here um, shows some of the tools that were used um, in ancient mining. Um, so the stone hammer on the left um, is one that's actually been carved to be ergonomically correct so that um, the person holding it um, has a good grip on it and it can be used then to um, extract the um, ore. Um, then up above, you'll see a bronze, tri uh, a, a bronze chisel. So around 1500, ancient miners began using these bronze instruments as a way to better um, target ore veins. Um, and then the bottom image um, is a tailings dump. So um, this is where um, ancient Egyptians and Nubians would have taken and put all the um, ore and debris that didn't contain gold. So what you can see here is that um, these ancient peoples are turning the earth inside out, um, at least on a modest scale um, in these tailing stumps. So in ancient times, Egypt and Nubia were renowned for their gold. And since the discovery of Tut's tomb in the 1920s, we modern observers have also associated these societies with plentiful gold. Yet mining gold was tough work. And in Northeast, in Northeast Africa's gold reserves proved stingier than those elsewhere on the continent. So today, archeologists estimate that over the 3000 years of pharaonic rule, only about 250,000 ounces of gold were mined. So if you were to average that out over time, that's less, that's only a little over 80 ounces of gold being mined each year. So it seems that pharaonic elites like Tut maintain their gold rich status, not just by mining gold, but by recycling the gold objects of their predecessors. So melting down those objects and then having their artisans recraft them into new spectacular things. So by comparison, when South Africa's gold production peaked in 1970, those mines would produce 250,000 ounces of gold every few days. Um, but before leaping to modern South Africa, we must first turn to the medieval world's most important source of gold, um, and that was West Africa. So in the 8th century, the Islamic Caliphate, um, founded in the Arabian Peninsula, adopted the gold dinar as its official currency. And this decision then created an, an unlimited and sustained demand for gold. And it was a demand that would stretch far into sub-Saharan Africa. 
By the 10th century, Arab writers viewed West Africa as the source of the very purest gold in the world. And it's estimated that about two thirds of the medieval world's gold came from West Africa. So West African gold mining took place um, in rock formations that stretched in the east from the present day country of Senegal through Mali and into Ghana. So across this region, um, gold is found as surface deposits, it's found in quartz ore, and it's also found mixed in with um, clay and sand and gravel. So between the 10th and the 15th centuries, the Bambuk, Bore, and Akan gold fields fed the Trans-Saharan trade and the rise of the West African empires of Ghana, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And you can see on this map um, the outlines of those three empires, and then you can also see the three gold fields um, indicated as well. So historians estimate estimate that each year around 26,000 um, ounces of gold flowed across the Saharan desert. So that was a much more robust trade than that had existed in ancient Egypt and Nubia. In exchange for gold, West Africans acquired salt, copper, and cloth. Um, rule, the rulers of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai benefited by taxing this trade and also commanding tribute from the mining communities. But unlike the Egyptian pharaohs, they don't seem to have directly controlled the gold fields. Instead, the gold fields were controlled by local chiefs and priests who performed rituals that ensured that the land would yield gold without taking the lives of too many miners. Now here in West Africa, gold mining was a secondary activity to farming. So during the dry season, men, women, and children who would normally be busy farming would turn their attention to mining. So they used the same tools for mining that they did for farming. So they used baskets and calabashes, as well as iron hoes, picks, and shovels. Gender and generation shaped the division of labor. So women and children washed and separated the gold from sand, um, while men excavated the ore. Most underground mining was done in open pits, but sometimes miners also dug vertical shafts that extended up to 60 feet below the surface and would have horizontal offshoots. So spiritual as well as social relations shaped West African gold mining. The combination of gold's unpredictability um, um, combined with the high danger of collapse and flooding prompted miners to offer sacrifices of alcohol and kola nuts to territorial spirits and to mystical snakes. Um, in medieval Europe too, many believed that the erratic world of underground mining was populated and was governed by spirits like gnomes and goblins. Now, the most famous figure associated with West African gold was not a spirit, um, but was a real man. And that was the Malian king, Mansa Musa, who's depicted here in the Spanish Atlas from 1375. So you'll see uh, Musa is in the right corner and he's wearing a gold crown and he's holding a gold scepter in one hand and a huge gold nugget in the other. Um, a few years ago, Time Magazine estimated that Mansa Musa was the richest person in world history. So that's in terms of his wealth relative to his contemporaries. Um, in 1324, uh, Mansa Musa, who was a Muslim, made the holy pilgrimage to Mecca or the Hajj. And in doing so, he captured the imagination of the medieval world. Um, so this map here shows in red um, Musa's route from West Africa across the Sahara, North Africa, Egypt um, to Mecca. Um, and that was a route that extended for 4,000 miles one way. So this was a massive um, journey that he took. So observers at the time marveled at his caravan. So one um, person described it as including 100 camel loads of gold while another described it as including 60,000 soldiers and 500 enslaved people, each of them carrying a gold wand weighing five pounds. During Musa's stopover in Cairo, he reportedly, uh, reportedly spent or gave away so much gold that the city's gold market was depressed for the next decade. 
It was this kind of wealth then that inspired Europeans to seek a sea route to the West African gold fields that would bypass the Muslim controlled Trans-Saharan routes. So during the late 1400s, the Portuguese successfully sailed from the Mediterranean down the west coast of Africa and gained more direct access to the Akan gold fields um, through um, establishing a fort um, at Elmina. And you can see Elmina here on this map um, at the very bottom. So Elmina on the coast of what is today um, Ghana. So from the start, the European presence on Africa's gold coast combine the gold trade with the slave trade in really complex ways. So Europeans purchased enslaved Africans to sell in the Mediterranean and later in the Americas, but they also purchased them to resell in Africa, mainly in exchange for gold. Africans living near the Akan gold fields and purchase, purchased enslaved people from European traders and used their forced labor to clear forests and to expand gold mining. Um, so this image here is a depiction um, by a Dutch artist based on reports from European missionaries and traders of what mining looked like um, in the Akan gold fields. And so what you see here is some Akan miners who are diving into a river um, with baskets or bowls um, to scoop up um, some of the soil um, then to pan it for the gold. Um, the Akan mines also included open pits um, that reach depths of uh, 100 feet with each um, pit engaging up to 100 workers. So increasing exploitation of the Akan gold fields led um, to the founding around 1700 of the Asante Empire um, by Osei Tutu. So in Asante, more so than in previous West African states, political and cultural life centered on gold. So according to oral tradition, Osei Tutu, who became the first, um, the first Asante Hini or emperor, um, he became the Asante Hini when the gold stool descended from the sky and alighted on his knees. Um, and we can see the gold stool in this um, photograph um, to the left of um, a much more recent Asante Hini. Um, so the gold school stool is covered in sheets of gold, um, and it still embodies to this day the unity of the Asante people, as well as the Asante Hini's power to ensure their well-being. So As uh, Asante's gold-rich culture produced beautiful objects, um, and in Seattle, at the Seattle Art Museum, we are lucky enough to have a few examples of the kind of um, intricate artistry that has been produced um, by Asante artists. Um, so the figures, the photographs on the left are um, actually made out of brass, but these were brass weights that were used to weigh um, gold dust. So they're very much tied to the trade in gold. Um, and on the right then, what you're seeing um, is two rings that are made um, out of gold. Um, so each of these objects um, is beautifully crafted, intricately crafted, but each of them is also tied to um, a proverb or proverbs so that when people look at these um, objects, they're reminded of, um, of wisdom. So just to give one example of this, um, the image of the bird um, in the upper left, so the Sankofa bird that's looking backward. So one of the proverbs associated with this figure is the proverb to pick up what falls behind. Um, and there are different ways to kind of uh, understand that or translate it, but one is that um, it's possible to correct past mistakes. And I always appreciate um, an optimistic um, proverb like that. Um, uh, the gold ring in the lower right corner is actually one of my favorite objects in the Seattle Art Museum um, African Art Collection. And so that is a ring that has spikes on it that are shaped um, like a porcupine. So some African elites, including those from Asante, profited from their participation in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, nonetheless, stretching over 400 years, the trade's cumulative impact on West Africa was devastating. So fueled by greed and anti-Black racism, the transatlantic trade resulted in more than 12 million Africans being torn from their homes and placed on slave ships that were bound for the Americas.
The transatlantic slave trade and the system of plantation slavery that it enabled in the U.S. and elsewhere undergirded the emergence of a capitalist world economy, um, an economy in which some regions of the world would prosper at the expense of others. The wealth and power that European countries gained during the era of the transatlantic slave trade enabled them to colonize virtually the entire continent of Africa in the late 19th century. And this twinning of capitalism and colonialism enabled new industrial forms of mining that accelerated the historical process of turning the world inside out. Um, and nowhere was that acceleration felt more deeply than on South Africa's Witwatersrand. So the Witwatersrand Basin, um, known more commonly as the Rand, is an ancient and an extraordinary geological formation. It began forming three billion years ago, before Earth even had continents. Over hundreds of millions of years, sea and land emerged and retreated, creating deep layers of sediment. Those layers were disrupted 200 million years ago when an enormous meteorite, um, six to 10 miles in diameter, collided with the Earth. That collision created a massive crater that brought deep layers containing gold and uranium to the surface. So this image um, that you see now is a really striking example of Rand ore, and it's actually quite a radioactive sample. So it contains gold um, ore as well as uranium. Since at least 1100, some Southern Africans had mined gold and they mainly did it for export into the Indian Ocean trade. No one, however, took much note of the Rand formation until the 1880s. By that decade, South Africa was teeming with mineral prospectors who had been drawn to the region by diamond discoveries. Um, and this map here shows you um, Kimberley. So Kimberley is um, the town where um, diamonds were discovered. And it was an area that was located just beyond the bounds of the British Cape Colony in the 1860s when diamonds were discovered. Now where gold or the Rand was discovered was in what became the city of Johannesburg, which you can see is just to the Northeast. And that site was located in the Transvaal Republic. So the Transvaal Republic was a republic founded by Afrikaners um, so people who were the white descendants of Dutch colonists who had originally colonized South Africa in the 17th century. Okay, so the significance of South Africa's diamond discovery was soon outstripped by gold. So in 1886, an Australian prospector stumbled upon a gold-rich outcropping of the Rand in the Transvaal Republic. Within 10 years, South Africa became the world's top producer of gold. And by 1914, South Africa was producing over 8 million ounces of gold per year, outstripping the U.S., South Africa's nearest gold producing competitor, by twofold. What makes the RAND so remarkable is not the purity of its gold. Even today, it takes about one ton of RAND ore to produce a single 14 karat gold chain. What is remarkable about, about the Rand's ore is its consistency and its scale. So the formation extends for over 200 miles, and much of it um, actually remains unmined today. So geologists estimate that about 50% of the world's gold still remains in the Rand formation. From surface outcroppings like this one discovered in 1886, the Rand dips steeply underground. So to date, humans have followed its mineral rich veins to depths of 2.5 miles. Yes, that is miles. So beneath the surface. At those depths, rock temperatures climb upwards of 150 degrees. And reaching those depths required massive investments of capital, technology, and labor. Now, what originally made those investments profitable was the international gold standard. So over the 19th century, first Britain and then the U.S. and other countries shifted from the silver standard to the gold, pegging their national currencies to gold reserves. The gold standard generated an unlimited demand for South African gold, and until the gold standard was abandoned during the um, Great Depression of the early 1930s, the Bank of London purchased all gold exported from South Africa at a fixed price. 
So just like the Islamic Caliphate's um, adoption of the gold dinar in the ninth century fueled medieval West African mining, the international gold standard of the 19th and early 20th century fueled modern South African mining. Yet the technologies that facilitated these two episodes were markedly different. The exploitation of the RAN was an extension of the Industrial Revolution. South African gold mining relied on steam engines, railways, and electricity, all powered by local coal deposits. It also relied on the recent inventions of dynamite for blasting, jackhammers for digging, steel stampers for crushing ore, and cyanide for extracting the ore. Um, so what you can see in this image here is um, an industrial mine site in South Africa. And then what you see in the background is the tailings dump. So that's the place where all the ore that doesn't have gold in it was um, piled up and dumped. And those tailings dumps could reach the height of a 25 story building. The development of the RAND spawned giant corporations that controlled scores of mines. Those mines recruited hundreds of managers and engineers, many of them from the US, to organize production and to refine existing technologies. So many Americans who had developed expertise um, in the California gold fields or also in Argentina then were drawn to South Africa and to the RAND. The RAND also drew thousands upon thousands of laborers from across the British Empire and the African subcontinent. In the 1890s, the high demand for labor on the RAND resulted in relatively high wages. These wages attracted experienced underground miners from Britain, uh, mainly from Cornwall, but they also attracted new recruits from across southern Africa. During the 1890s, the underground workforce totaled about 80,000 workers, and 78,000 of those were Black Africans. The size of the workforce would peak nearly a century later in 1985 at 500,000 um, Black African workers. Demand for labor was so great that between 1904 and 1910, mine owners also recruited 60,000 laborers from China. The RAND quickly developed a racialized and often violent labor system with white workers placed in supervisory positions and paid significantly higher wages. African miners were mainly labor migrants drawn from peasant households across the country, but across the subcontinent as well. So migrants came from the present day countries of Mozambique, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, Malawi, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, and even as far north as Tanzania. As migrants, they worked contracts of anywhere from three to nine months and traveled home and then often returned again to work additional contracts. While on the mines, the companies housed African workers in huge all-male compounds. So a law dating back to 1896 prohibited girls and women from working underground. So this photograph here is by um, the renowned US um, photographer, Margaret Bork White. Um, and she was famous in the mid 20th century for her sympathetic um, portrayals of industrial workers. And what you can see, what she's doing here is she's trying to show you kind of the behind the scenes conditions at the mines. So this photograph here um, combines a depiction of what were some pretty grim living conditions in the compounds with images of workers um, on the left who have the sheepskin leggings on preparing for a dance competition. And these competitions happened within the mines, um, but by the 1950s, they had actually become a tourist attraction. And so in this photograph, Burke White is kind of showing us a little bit behind the scenes um, of that tourist attraction um, in the life in the mines. African men worked on the mines to pay colonial taxes and to help feed their families, but they also worked with other more specific goals in mind, such as buying cattle to pay bride wealth and to marry, um, or earning cash to build rural homesteads, pay school fees, or buy a radio or TV. Gold mining was absolutely integral to the spread of a cash economy and European colonial rule across the region. Within South Africa, mining strengthened a form of settler colonialism more akin to that found in the United States than in other African colonies. Like many other industrial developments, gold mining produced wealth as well as cascading forms of discontent. 
Between 1899 and 1902, the British waged the South African or Anglo-Boer War against the Afrikaner republics to gain greater control of the gold mines. That war cost the lives of tens of thousands of British soldiers, as well as white and black South Africans. Following the war, English and Afrikaner elites reached a political compromise that was rooted in the joint subjugation of the black population. In 1948, the introduction of apartheid or racial separateness further entrenched white supremacy. From its inception, apartheid faced internal opposition from various groups, including liberals, African nationalists, socialists, and communists. Um, and the photo here shows um, an African woman participating in the defiance campaign, which was a mass protest that was organized by the African National Congress um, in 1952. After decades of resistance from both in and outside the country, white minority rule was finally dismantled in 1994. That year, Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first democratically elected president. Gold mining fueled the development of secondary industry and manufacturing, making 20th century South Africa the most developed, if deeply unequal, capitalist economy on the continent. The phrase racial capitalism, which some scholars and activists use today, was first coined, in fact, to describe apartheid South Africa. Gold mining also cost thousands, um, countless lives. Miners died from rock falls, explosions, and fires underground, as well as from silicosis and tuberculosis, diseases that developed in their lungs after years spent underground inhaling silica dust. Today, many of South Africa's mines are too expensive to operate and lay largely abandoned. Abandoned mines pose challenges to human health and to the environment. Shafts fill with water that dissolve heavy metals into the water table. Um, other toxins blow in the air from tailings dumps that have long defined Johannesburg's above ground landscape. But in recent years, those um, dumps have been reclaimed and reprocessed. So this is earth turned inside out on a massive scale. It's also the target of activism by local environmental and community groups. Across South Africa's history of mining labor and protests, gold in the form of gold coins has played a unique role. So until the early 1930s, when the gold standard collapsed, African workers successfully insisted that they be paid in gold coins, um, specifically the British sovereign shown here, rather than in paper currency. They preferred gold for its durability and its dignity. Um, so here is a quote from a man who was a miner in the 1920s, explaining to researchers um, in the 1990s why it was that he um, and his fellow miners preferred to be paid in gold. Quote, gold money is better because even if you hit it, it remains money. It does not get soaked in rain. It still remains money. Gold is money with dignity that you can even feel when you're handling it. 50 years later, a new South African gold coin, the Krugerrand, took on a different meaning. Krugerrands containing one ounce of gold each were introduced by the apartheid government in 1967 as another way to sell gold internationally. They proved enormously popular, especially um, in the US. So Americans bought nearly $1 billion worth of Krugerrands in 1980 alone. That's $1 billion. Um, U.S. anti-apartheid activists led by the African-American organization TransAfrica responded to this popularity by making Krugerrands a target of their protests. So their highly visible boycott campaign resulted in a federal ban on Krugerrand imports in 1986 and helped to spread the anti-apartheid movement to college campuses across this country. Um, the anti-apartheid movement powerfully combined anti-racist and feminist activism with, de with demands for universal human rights and economic justice. And it was the power of that movement, both in and outside of South Africa, that inspired me um, and others of my generation to study African history. So this evening we have traveled from ancient Egypt and Nubia to modern South Africa via medieval West Africa. 
So this whirlwind tour has, I hoped, illuminated how mining is a historically deep technological process in Africa. And that it's a techno technological process that has consistently linked Africa to the wider world. Mining in Africa has generated significant wealth, enabling many to sustain themselves and some to enrich themselves. Mining has also fueled new technologies. It has um, fueled forced labor as well as settler colonialism, racialized injustice, death and illness. Africa's contemporary mining boom is part of a much longer history of humans turning the earth inside out. It's also part of what binds the state of Washington where so many of us live to Africa. So as many of you know, the Hanford nuclear site in Eastern Washington is the place where during World War II, uranium was enriched for the first atomic bombs. Hanford manufactured the bomb that the US government detonated over Nagasaki, Japan in 1945, killing tens of thousands of people. Today, Hanford is the most contaminated nuclear site in the country and the site of the largest environmental cleanup in US history. What you might not know is that most of the early uranium used at Hanford came from Africa, in particular from the Shinkolobwe mine in what was then the Belgian Congo and now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uranium from Shinkolobwe brings us back to one of the places where we started, coltan and cobalt mines in the DRC. So in the early 2000s, as commodity um, prices boomed across the globe, the abandoned Shokalobwe mine became a hotspot um, for cobalt mining. So under treacherous conditions, thousands of miners and their families searched for cobalt in pits just near to where uranium was first mined and sent to Hanford. Whereas the uranium um, powered atomic bombs Cobalt powers our smartphones and lithium batteries. So for more than 80 years now, Washington State's most impactful technologies and most pressing discontents have been deeply intertwined with the history of those very same things in Africa. Thank you. Um, and so my last slide here is a shout out and a thanks to all the people who helped me pull this lecture together. Um, given how many topics and time periods I was discussing, it really took a whole village to help me pull this lecture together. So I want to thank all my UW colleagues and then all my colleagues um, beyond UW. So now I will welcome Professor Adam Warren back to our virtual stage so that we can have a little Q&A. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture, Professor Thomas. Um, there are so many questions that I have, and I'm sure I, I can see that uh, several audience members also sent in questions, um, and we will get to those. But I want to um, uh, offer a, a first question of my own. So one of the things that really struck me about this uh, lecture was the slide, uh, the, the photograph that you um, uh, placed in the slideshow by Margaret Bork Wright of gold miners in compound housing in um, 1950. And it, it was evocative in so many ways. And it in part, I think, emphasizes how uh, commodities industries like, like gold mining transform entire areas and create new kinds of communities uh, around the sort of the centers of labor. Um, and the question I had is uh, in that section on the Rand, you, you speak so eloquently about how, um, how the, the Rand became a, a destination of migrants seeking to work in mining uh, who left their own communities. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the communities those migrants came from uh, were transformed by the, the uh, growth of gold mining. Yes. Yeah. So that is that's a great question. Um, so the system of labor migrancy that was envisioned on the gold mines um, was a system that assumed that Africans were rural people and would stay and live in rural areas. So the idea was you're just bringing African workers for set amount of times to these urban areas like Johannesburg, um, and then they'll go back home. Um, so that system had a profound impact 
both economically, but also emotionally on African family life in rural areas. Um, but what would happen over time is that Africans would absolutely challenge this designation of them as rural folks. Um, and in fact, Africans had always been part of South African cities, you know, going back to the founding of Cape Town um, in the 17th century. Um, so um, over time, um, women and other people would move um, into Africa, um, African cities and particularly for Johannesburg, um, the interwar period onwards is a period of tremendous growth um, in the African populations in urban areas. So there, the, there was a way in which the mining industry was always predicated on a fiction that mm -hmm. African families would stay in rural areas and only men would migrate in. Um, the labor migrancy system though had profound impacts across the entire region. Um, and it was coupled also with um, land alienation. So basically land mm -hmm. being taken away from Africans um, in South Africa and reallocated um, particularly to um, white farmers. Um, and so that would also um, drive poverty within um, rural areas, then that would also encourage more people to come to urban areas. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so uh, an audience member sent in a question uh, that is about the sort of revenue stream that mining creates. And this audience member, I'm paraphrasing here, um, Rec recognize that obviously uh, uh, gold mining is a lucrative business uh, that brings money into the pockets of, of many, but was wondering about the larger effects on the economies of various African countries. And I think was, was trying to, uh, to understand uh, whether gold mining fuels development um, or whether it actually uh, undermines broader processes of development. Okay, so that, that's a great question. Um, and you know, the answer would vary from place to place. Um, so in South Africa, gold mining generated a tremendous amount of wealth and completely transformed the economy. So um, nowhere, um, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, would you have the level of industrial development that you have in South Africa, even by the 1920s and 1930s. And that was because all these forms of manufacturing and secondary industry kind of arose to um, support um, the gold mining industry. Um, but it was a very deeply unequal um, form of economic development um, in South Africa. So it was a form of development that certainly made the mine um, companies wealthy and um, provided um, tax and revenue streams for the South African government to do a whole bunch of things. But it, um, under racial segregation and then under apartheid, it did things and it um, expanded you know, infrastructure and all kinds of things in ways that certainly privileged um, the white population. Um, a lot of people talk about the resource curse. So normally it's more commonly talked about in relation to oil and gas, but sometimes it's also talked about um, in relation to minerals. And the truth is in Africa today, it is very hard for governments to effectively tax uh, mineral extraction. It's actually harder to um, tax mineral extraction for a variety of reasons than it is even um, for gold, um, oil or natural gas. Mm -hmm. But I would say one country that really stands out um, doing a really good job in the post-colonial period of managing the wealth generated from minerals um, for the nation really is Botswana. Um, so Botswana is in a partnership with um, a mining company. So together, basically the um, government of Botswana partly owns the diamond mines um, within Botswana and overall has done um, quite a good job since the 1960s of using that wealth to really fuel um, developments in the country um, that benefited um, the majority population are, are lots of people in the country. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened um, in a lot of other places. Mm. Fascinating. So um, this ties into another question, which was, um, you mentioned the, the, the concept of racial capitalism in the, the talk, and uh, an audience member was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, Cedric Robinson, who uh, um, was an African-American political scientist and theorist, was one of the first people to really use that term racial capitalism more broadly. But in his writings, he talks about how it really came out of his and other people's thinking um, about apartheid South Africa in the 1970s and the 1980s and thinking about how in South Africa, you had this system of um, capitalism 
that was booming, but that was um, very dependent on these tremendous um, inequalities that were rooted um, in race. And so that it was impossible to think of capitalism in South Africa, but also in other cases. And Robinson and others would apply it to the US and other places, saying that it's impossible to think about the history of capitalism without um, thinking about the history of um, racialized inequalities and racialized injustice. Great, thank you. Um, is the the history of so much of the talk was about uh, was about gold, but obviously mining in, in across Africa involves various different minerals. Uh, it does is there is the history of um, other uh, mineral commodities remarkably different from the history of gold mining? Obviously, this is a history that goes back much farther. Uh, but in the twentieth century, do other extractive industries resemble? uh gold mining in their sort of structure and form yeah so that's a great question so the reason why i really chose gold is i thought gold was the best mineral for illustrating this connecting of africa to the wider world through minerals so i it would be I, you'd be hard pressed to find another mineral i think over the length of the thousands of years of african history mm -hmm. that has done more to connect africa to the wider world um but in terms of african history and kind of deep african history i would say iron and copper have been um, as important or probably even more important to transformations um, within the continent. Um, iron was mined very early in many, many different parts across the continent. Um, so yeah, so I think gold is unique partly because of its ties to currency and the gold standard in linking the continent um, to kind of the Islamic, Mediterranean, medieval world, um, and then to the international kind of world economy in the 19th um, and 20th century. Um, one thing that's really interesting um, is today South Africa is no longer um, the top producer of gold in the world. Um, and in fact, um, I think as of last year, Ghana is actually exporting more gold than South Africa is, even though the RAND still contains um, at least probably about 50% of the world's gold reserve. Mm -hmm. And the reason there is that mining in South Africa has become very, very expensive um, because of the depths of the mines um, and other factors as well. Um, and so right now, one of the most important minerals that's exported from South Africa is actually platinum, um, is an incredibly important export coming from South Africa, I mean, diamonds as well. Um, but actually the, the landscape of gold mining in Africa today, I would say in 2021, is actually kind of more varied and is in more different places on the continent than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Interesting. And in the areas of the Rand where mining was was predominant, uh, has there emerged, as has happened in some other parts of the world, I'm thinking about, for example, Bolivia and Peru, where I do research, has there emerged a tourist industry around the mining sites? <sighs> Yeah, there are there is tourism around the mining sites, and you can um, go on tours. Um, there is all there are also other things like casinos that are built up around them as well. Um, another interesting thing to say about um, the mines in South Africa today is that. Um, Although mining companies don't find um, the, the abandoned mines pro often very profitable to mine, there is, um, over the past decade or so, there's been a growing um, group of artisanal miners. So mm -hmm. people who, um, not legally, but um, come into the old mining sites um, and try uh, kind of on an individual basis um, to um, extract gold. Um, and so the number of people doing that has actually grown in recent years. It's, um, of course, very dangerous um, work as well, but it shows you the kind of circumstances that people are living in, um, in terms of the poverty they face, that they're willing to um, risk their lives to kind of engage in that um, production there. So in that sense, artisanal gold mining has kind of come back on the Rand mm -hmm. um, in a way that it hadn't existed for a very long time. And one final question. So um, you, you, over the course of your career, you've done research on a variety of different topics and your, your research has always moved in quite ambitious ways across different parts of the African continent um, and to different topics. And I understand that you're moving now into environmental history and that while that is not necessarily a history of mining, um, that is the direction of your research. I wondered if you could um, reflect a little bit on what's drawing you toward environmental history at this time. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I just finished a book that I had worked on for a very long time. Um, and part of what working on that book for a long time made me very interested in was kind of the material history of Africa. Um, so the material history of kind of objects and things. Um, yeah, and so I see kind of working on environmental history um, as a way to um, kind of explore those issues of different kinds of materials in new ways. And I'm also interested in doing a kind of environmental history that would actually go back to some of my earlier work, which was on um, the history of politics around reproduction in Africa. And so I'm interested in how in different African contexts, um, discussions about um, kind of population and the ways in which, um, you know, in countries across the continent, there have been dramatic increases in population over the past 50 or 60 years, the ways that actors on the ground see the, those, the challenges that are posed by that relating um, to issues around the environment as well. So, yeah, so in a way it's also coming back to some older interests that I've had. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, for Professor Thomas, for this really terrific talk. I learned so much, and I'm sure that all of the audience members and viewers did as well. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who attended the session and remind them that there are three more talks in this series by Professor Vicente Rafael, uh, Professor Bruce Hevely, and uh, Professor Margaret Amara coming up uh, tomorrow on January 27th on February 3rd and on February 10th. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much for attending and good evening. Thank you.